Welcome to season three of the Iceman Kicking Podcast. My name is Brett Arkellian. Kick your feet up, relax, and enjoy this episode of the Iceman Kicking Podcast. They call me the- For you guys that, that may know Brett but don't know, I mean, the guy knows what he's talking about. Congrats to Virginia Tech for hiring a guy that really knows what he's talking about. Welcome to the Iceman Kicking Podcast. It's the show with cold questions and even cooler guests. And I'm here, uh, your host, Brett Arkellian, with a very, very special guest today. Um, I do tend to say that a lot, but we have our first head coach, all right, and a man that's very near and dear to my car, uh, heart here, a coach who has built one of the most successful programs into a nationally known brand name, a Power Five coach, a professional head coach, a man who has coached overseas, Uh, A broadcaster who has a flair and a zest to be an entertainer. Uh, The 2018 Eddie Robinson and Big Sky Coach of the Year Award winner, two-time WAC Coach of the Year, and the pride of Beaver, California, a man that needs no introduction, the head coach of the UC Davis Aggies, Coach Dan Hawkins. Coach Hawk, how you doing? Well, you're first going to have to tell them where it is, Bieber, California. So uh, I uh, hope I have the pride. That, that's probably the greatest honor I have right now, other than being the grandparent to my 11 grandkids. So now appreciate it, Brett. Have a lot of respect for you, and I'm glad you're doing this. It's great for your career and good for, for all the other guys to listen as well. Well, I appreciate people like you that encourage me. You got it. From my short coaching career, I've realized you have to find people that uh, believe in you and encourage you in the right direction. And you're definitely one of those people. So thank you for the opportunity. My pleasure. At this point, at this point in my career, I'm this is my 40th year in football. And uh, I do take a lot of joy in uh, mentoring you guys and helping you guys. And I've made enough mistakes for all of us combined. But I do take a lot of joy in that. I think a lot of it we got to figure out on our own. But uh, my dad was awesome. He was, he was a logger and that, that was great. But when I got into coaching, I knew nothing about the profession. I learned a lot at Davis about coaching, but about the profession, I knew nothing. Yeah. You, you come from very humble beginnings. And one thing too, that, that surprised me, coach, you kind of hit on it a little bit. Like you're when, when I'm the, one of the first things I realized about you and being in the office with the whole staff, just fantastic. Everyone's and we'll talk about Davis guys in a second, but you're always asking questions. You're always trying to alter the way we look at things. How are you still so passionate about coaching? And where does that, you know, always, you've probably done it all, seen it all, ran it, you know, many different ways. How do you still have that, that zest and that, you know, question making ability? I still have a zest for learning. As you know, football has changed. I mean, more in the last five years, in my opinion, than it probably did the previous 30. And I enjoy learning. I enjoy staying ahead of it. I don't, I try to read some fiction. I'm not real good at it. If I read something, it's, I want it to be something I can give to the staff or I can give to the players. And I watch documentaries, but uh, this whole idea of kind of chasing excellence and getting better is it it was kind of ingrained, I think, from my dad when I was a little kid. And I, I enjoy that. Uh, And then I do have, as you know, I have a real passion for um, just our players and wanting them to have the best possible experience. And when we got together with the, with the specs and, and had our little unity meeting there, one of the questions we asked everybody was what their biggest fear was. And I told them my, my biggest fear really is not being good enough for them. And so, I mean, there's positive on one side, there's fear on the other of just trying to be a really great head coach and a really good coach and a good mentor. And for those guys, and, and for you guys too, for the guys on the staff, I want to, I met with Dirk Cutter up here yesterday and he's been in the NFL and asked him a bunch of questions about, you know, what can I do to get you guys there? How do I develop you guys? What are the skills you guys need to learn? And I, I don't know. That's just been a passion of mine. And so that kind of fuels me every day. And I guess when I wake up and don't have that, I'll know it's time to, to call it quits. That's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Helping others seems like it's a big deal to you. And it goes a long way for us too. personally, me being a California kid, 
I'm very proud to come home uh, and represent the University of California at Davis. It's very exciting for me. For you, well, you were a bone-crushing, blistering fullback at the College of Siskiyous back in the day, and then you you came and wore number 34 uh, at UC Davis, and you played on multiple uh, teams of the 20 straight conference championship UC Davis football teams, which for you college football history buffs, never been done before, more than Alabama. All right. So Ted, give us a little brief overview of your career and how you got to becoming the head coach at UC Davis. Yeah, and it did start. It was my baptism of excellence when I came to Davis. Of course, Jim Soaker was a Hall of Fame coach and Bob Foster and Nathaniel Hackett, who's uh, at Denver as a Davis guy. Mike Bellotti is a Davis guy that was at Oregon Hall of Fame coach, Chris Peterson at Washington. Gary Patterson did not play at Davis, but coached at Davis. Uh, just a, I don't, I don't know of any Davis guy that's gone into coaching that hasn't had some modem of, of success. And I think they get the science of football because there is something to that. But then they also get the zest for life and how you weave that in there. And that's, as you know, that's a secret sauce that people have a hard time. It's not just all hugs and kisses, and it's not, but it's it's not all just put your nose on the grindstone and and do ball till you pass out. It's it's neither one of those. So it, it all started at Davis when I was a player, and I just noticed a bunch of little nuances. And when I started coaching, I just tried to emulate what I had learned at Davis. Now. I fell on my face several times and got skinned up and, and learned lessons from there. And really how I got back to Davis, it was never my goal. I coached at Colorado and Boise and I coached in the Canadian league, as you mentioned in Montreal, I never, I was a kid from a town of 500 people with 150 kids in the school. I just wanted to be a good husband, a good father and a good coach. And I just really was passionate about, being a great coach and I just tried to get better and I tried to learn and then then things happened and things opened up but it it was never my goal I didn't I grew up in a little town we didn't really have a close university or I mean the 49ers were somewhere but we, I so I didn't really have a favorite school or a favorite pro team uh I and so you know things just just led me down the path and then uh, as you mentioned, I was out and kind of bouncing around a little bit doing the the, uh, the international football scene, which was great, and doing the TV scene with the ESPN, but really wanted to get back to coaching, just mentoring kids, and had an opportunity to go with uh, Butch Davis down to FIU in Florida and was going there as the OC, and then the Davis thing happened, and it really was an opportunity for me to give back, or really an opportunity for preserve our way of life at Davis and how we do things, and and I believe so strongly in that. So it's really a labor of love. So it's an opportunity for me to kind of give back to my beginnings. And it's not about making money. It's not, it's not about fame or fortune or all that. It's really just trying to invest into a program that's developing coaches like you and helping you along your career and our players um, and making them or helping them have a great experience and win some championships and, and get in the playoffs and, and chase excellence themselves. So really fulfilling. And that, that's, the, that's why I came back to Davis really was just to kind of help continue to, to grow and fertilize and water and, and you know, grow the, the Davis garden that's been going on for a long time. Yeah, just like you said, preserve the, the Davis way of life, right? And again, I said, we're going to get into that, that what, you know, what it means to be a Davis guy. But, uh, you know, I, I saw that, too, and I had to notice that. And many people don't know that, too. You had the opportunity to be the OC at FIU. How long was that for? And, and do you ever think about how things could be different? Not, I'm sure, not the fame, the fortune thing. You've done it before, yeah. but, you know. I, uh, I, I've been a head coach, Ark. I've been a head coach. There's only one time in my 40 years of football that I only, and I say only, coached a position. I've either been the head coach, the OC, the DC, or the special teams coach. Every, every year I've been in football, so I've, I've kind of been in charge, but I've been the head coach. I've had a strange career. The majority of my years has been as a head coach. So I thought going to FIU with Butch Davis, who's he won a national championship in Miami. He'd been in the NFL, the Cowboys. He won a Super Bowl. I'm thinking, okay, this is a great chance to go learn from a guy and go to Florida. I had not been there 
again, I'm all about adventure. I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to live on the East Coast and, and on the Atlantic Ocean and coach at FIU and learn from Butch. And I had gone down there. I'd spent a week there. We talked about what we're going to do and recruiting and putting the staff together. And I'd gone back. I was working out of Boise at the time. And I mean, I literally had two huge bags packed. They were ready to go. I was leaving. And then, then the Davis thing happened. And so Butch was great about it. And I just said, hey, Butch, this is just this is bigger than me and bigger than football. And I need to go back there and do this because it's my school and I need to help these guys. And um, so I don't, I never have a lot of regrets, Ark. I, things happen and you move on. And I think they all happen for a reason. And you just kind of got to be open to the, to the universe there a little bit, but I never looked about, Oh, what if you just stayed? What if you did gone? I don't, I mean, it's easy to play that game, but I never, I don't really do that too much. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just interesting is not talked about and I'm sure it was a short time period. So you don't really see that, but you hit on that a little bit too. I want to talk about your prowess with coaching different things. Okay. In the interview, when you uh, took the UC Davis job, uh, you said that you outkicked your coverage, but you said, yeah, but you have to know how to punt. Love that line, first of all, which is great. And your wife, Misty, is, she's amazing. Um, but also, I want to hit on the special teams. This is a special teams podcast. Why are you so into special teams? I mean, you just said it. You've been the OC for so many years, even the DC, and also the head coach for so many years. What makes you so passionate about special teams? I love it. When I went to Willamette, University in Salem, Oregon in 1993, I was the head coach and uh, they had struggled a little bit. And so I took over the program and it was pretty clear to me. In fact, that year we had, I think we ended the season with 43 guys on our football team. I think we started off with 54 and, but I said, we've got to be good in special teams. And back in the day, Brett, and <laughs> I mean, I remember when I played at Davis, no shit on Davis, we basically used to kind of walk through special teams on Friday. We never did any individual. We didn't ever meet on it. We didn't. That's kind of what you did. It's almost like this unwritten rule of, okay, let's just do the special teams thing and then get to the offense defense. So, but I get to Willamette and I'm going, we, we got to be good in special teams. We just have to. So I started really getting out and grinding and, um, Al Everest, who was the special teams coach of the year and had been to several NFL teams. I ran into Al, I believe he was in Arizona at the time with the Cardinals. Uh, Chuck Prefer was another guy in the NFL that was into it deep. And those guys were very, very good to me. And I really grinded it and I got after it. In fact, Al Everest one time in Arizona, I think we were down in Flagstaff at NAU at training camp and I was bugging him so much. Like he knew that I had a genuine passion for it. And I would go to his dorm room and sit in his dorm room and watch film. And like, he loved it. And I loved it. Like he knew that I was not just there to hang out and, you know, watch some guys play. And so he helped me a tremendous amount. And then, so, and I really got into it because I do think it's still one of those last bastions of football to some degree. Uh, you are a unique talent. And I've told you this before, because you can coach the specs and you understand the specs, but then you have the greater understanding and passion for the rest of uh, special teams. And that's hard because you get some guys that are special teams guy, but don't know anything about specs or they're all specs and don't get the special teams part. So you got a great career in front of you. So you have some holes you've already filled that I never did. But so I got into it that way. And then as Dirk Cutter took over at Boise State, he came from Oregon. And I spent a bunch of time down in Oregon because Willamette, Salem's, you know, 45 minutes from Eugene. I was down there a lot. Chris Peterson was down there. Mike Bellotti, Nick Aliotti, and Neil Zambucas, all these Davis guys were at Oregon. And Tom Osborne was their special teams coach. So, and then Dirk took me to, to Boise and I was the special teams coach. And it was kind of baptism by fire. I mean, truthfully, I knew a lot about special teams, but as you all know, the probably one of the biggest things about making that jump, it's not the schemes, it's getting everything organized and practicing and teaching and getting your coaches organized and your meetings organized and your drills organized and your equipment people organized. I mean, it's, that's what it is. And that's why I, you know, of course, Harbaugh at the Ravens is a, was a former special teams guy. I think special teams coaches make great head coaches because you got to juggle a lot of balls. I mean, you're involved with every guy on the team. 
So I really got into it and I loved it. And I love the complexity of it. And then of course, the Canadian league game is wild, wild beyond measure, all the stuff you can do in special teams. And I love that. I mean, the, the true onside kick. I mean, people think about it in America. That's not what it is because in Canada, you can do an onside kick and motion somebody behind the punter or kicker and punt it down the field. And if you're the last touch out of bounds, your ball. I mean, crazy, wacky stuff. Uh, but I love, I love that. So I've always really, really been into it. And then, as you all know, I'm a big Maslow guy, and it's, it's, it's an opportunity to create roles for people. And it's not, it's not scrubiner time, but you're finding a guy on your team that can do a small detail, full speed at a high level of efficiency all the time. Because special teams coaches, you get one down. Offensive guy, he gets three. Defensive guy, he gets three. Special teams guy, we get one. Um, so all of that combined is just is super fascinating to me. Me too. I love that aspect that it's kind of overlooked. I remember playing high school football, and I only played my junior and senior year because I needed a kicker. And I'm watching these teams and their punt protection is horrible. You know, it's forever. You know, the snappers don't get me started. They're just lobbing the ball back there. And I'm like, can we not pressure these guys and go change the game, block a kick? Uh, so just getting here and the, the whole culture, and I really do appreciate those things. I know I'm nowhere where uh, I need to be, but uh, to be around great coaches like you and Hixie and all the coaches on the staff, I mean, it really ups my game. Just the whole yeah, taking advantage of special teams is so important. Yeah, it's just you, you hear me say it a lot is three plays a game. And I mean, where are those three plays? And uh, I, I think special teams, number one, the sad thing is you can lose a game in a hurry. Like it's probably the most volatile, volatile thing on your on your team. So if you're not at least decent, you're go, you're going to lose football games. Now, the other side is winning football games, but Boy, if you're not very good, you're going to lose football games no matter how good you are on offense and defense. So there's a high degree of uh, it is special ops, and you better be good at it. Absolutely. I love that, how the intensity of it, too. I mean, that's one thing that I've learned from my past places. Anytime we touch the field, it better be intense. Practice better be intense. When we're sending those pump block guys at UC Davis on the uh, scout looks, I mean, those guys are getting after it, and that is exciting to see. Now, rewind a little bit here. Uh, I can't pass up all the success you had at Boise State. Okay. As a head coach, you were 53 and 11 in five seasons as a head coach, including a 37 and three whack record with four straight whack titles. Only Walter Camp, George Washington Woodruff, and Bob Pruitt have more total wins in their first five years of head coaching. And you also still hold the, well, rest in peace, the 31 game whack winning streak. Now the whack's coming back, though. They're, they're, uh, Making trying, a, to. trying to make a comeback. Teams are falling off left and right. You talked about Coach Cutter. Um, talk about you You were in that program, and really you were part of that buildup to that national exposure. What does it take? What's the secret sauce to building a program? Well, in truth, and people have talked to me about that, and I'm not trying to be self-depreciating or honest. It's it's funny because then, then you fast forward to Colorado where, where I got fired, and there's there, there's reasons and rational reasons of why things happen. And a couple things, Boise State has always been good. They won a national junior college championship, D2. They won it in FCS football. Um, they went through a period there where Pokey Allen was the coach. He got cancer. They moved up into FBS. They went through a number of coaches and transition. And so Houston Nutt had been there and then Dirk Cutter came. And so Dirk really, in my opinion, and I'm not just, he got the thing going because we, I think we won six games the first year and then we won 10 games back to back and won a bowl game back to back and won the championship. And so Dirk really did the heavy lifting to get that thing going, but you can always get players there that it's community supportive of football. And so it was a good play. And most coaches that have been there have had success. Most of them have because you can get players and they're supportive of football there. So really what I did is I was able to kind of sustain the model that Dirk put forward. Cause truthfully, I didn't know anything about division one football. 
and I learned it from Dirk. Now, Dirk had been with Bob Stoll. He'd been with Tom Coughlin. He'd been with Mike Bellotti. I mean, Dirk had a, a good, well-rounded Division One experience, and he was able to kind of pick and choose these elements. So I learned a bunch from Dirk. So a lot of the template, we did keep the same. Um, where I changed it a little bit was probably Dirk had to kind of do the heavy lifting. And then I tried to kind of provide some helium there. And we were lucky to get a good staff and Chris Peterson. And this is where the continuity thing, because Pete had been with Dirk at Oregon. So when Pete came, he knew all the terminology and he knew the system. And so Pete was awesome, really creative mind. And of course, he's a Davis guy. So we kind of operated the same. But I really tried to just uh, to try to work on kind of the bigger picture in terms of down the road of getting the community involved and the school involved and what we could be and then providing some of the motivational framework a little bit of really up in the up in the ante there. I mean, I, I remember telling somebody we could be a top 15 team every year and people sort of laughing. And I said, no, we, we could. We could be like Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and so that part of it, and we were able to get some really good players. They believed in what we were doing. Now, I'm not going to lie. The first year we lost to South Carolina on the road. Then we lost to Washington state. So we're Owen two, and people are looking at like, who is this guy? But that was also the year we beat Fresno state. Uh, they were ranked number eight in the country and it was a Thursday night game. And that kind of helped. That was Phil Jackson's breakthrough moment. And so then we're able to kind of keep sustaining that. But our administration, our community, the fans, um, ESPN, getting on ESPN helped us a bunch. But we had a lot of good football players. We had a lot of good guys that ended up playing in the National Football League, you know, and, and good coaches, too. I mean, Robert Prince was our receiver coach. He's, he's in the league. Chris Strasser was our O-line coach. He's in the league. I mean, there were a lot of really good coaches on that staff. So we had a good staff, a lot of good players and really good culture. And it all, it all kind of came together. Well, the one thing too, I think you hit on is like, you are coach. I've been at four or five different schools and the staffs I've been on two of them have been fired. And I've really understood like as a head coach, you have to be very uh, encompassing of the community and willing to go out there. And, and I'm not saying you're a fantastic coach, but you are really good being a people to people person and, and, communicating that way and people love to talk to you so because you're very real and you're very authentic with whoever you meet so I can I can see that and then obviously all the coaches and everyone around you was fantastic too so well you you know our situation and I just think you talk about Davis guys I think most of them are pretty humble and pretty down to earth and pretty well rounded uh I think that's just how we were raised and who we are and and in our organization and you know this I don't care if you're the the new student equipment person or manager or, or what like everybody we need everybody in this deal and so I just kind of grew up in that environment it's not that somebody's a GA or a quality control guy and it's not that you worship the OC or the head coach I mean everybody's got a role but and again I, I kind of go back to my dad my dad was the same way my dad was a he was a logger but just, I think just being able to have an environment where people feel welcome and on point and valued. And I mean, I, I know there are some places where when the head coach walks down the hall, you don't look at him, you don't talk to him, you don't acknowledge him, you don't. And I'm not saying that's bad. That's just not me. It's just not. And, uh, but I think that's kind of part of what, what the whole Davis thing has been about because you've had people who've been phenomenal business people, scientists, coaches. But, you know, you never know it. They're just super down to earth people when you meet them and talk to them. Absolutely. Yep. Those are Davis guys. Also too, that I, I still remember that game, obviously being a kid from Fresno, California, that 2001, I've, I've told you about it too. It broke my heart, man. It broke, broke my, my dad's heart too. He said, that's, that's the time Fresno could have been that team. And instead Boise was, and I can just remember coach Hawk giving a good fist bump when they stopped David Carr and the 12 year line and, how quiet that stadium was. I'm sure that was a great feeling. Well, what was, there was a lot of things that were great about it. There's a few things that, that do stick out in my mind, but one is, again, you think about how things go, but we had a screen pass designed to go into the boundary to the left and our line went left and our running back went right. 
and our quarterback looks left, nobody there. He finds him right. He throws it to him. He runs in. Like we score a touchdown from like 30 yards out, totally a busted play. And then a bigger play later in the game, we kind of sprint out. We got a backside spurt route going, and it's double covered. And we're thinking, no, don't throw it. And he throws it. Fresno guys run it. Everybody smashes. They fall on the ground. Our guy catches it and runs it in. So, I mean, sometimes it's just it, – it's the fickle finger of fate. And I, I know all the – I know all the sayings about luck. I get it. But – and then really the cool thing is down towards the end, it's getting – that's the last play of the game. There's timeout by Fresno. And and we bring the guys over. And really we're asking the, the defensive guys, like, what do you, what do you want to do? And our defensive guys, let's go after him. Let's go after him. And I remember one of our – we had a former walk-on. He was a, a running back turned safety. He was a great player. He was a great special teams player, Greg Sasser. He's like, hey, I, we're going to die on the attack. Let's go. And so, yeah, we, we blitz him, and we end up getting to him and sacking him and game over. So part of it, again, is that psychology, just cool of the ownership of our players and us trusting our players and believing in our players and them going, Hey, yeah, make the call, man. It's your game. You want to go get them. Let's go get them. That's so cool. And especially, I mean, you're facing the number one or the top drafted quarterback, uh, you know, in the NFL the next year. And you're like, let's go full bullets. I love that. I freaking love that. All right. So to get into, to advance a little bit, you know, and talk about briefly talk about your career at Colorado, but you had some of the most quotable sayings of all time. And, I was in sixth grade in Mr. Shelby's class at Century Elementary in Clovis, California. And I was running around recess telling kids, it's the Big 12. Hey, in the murals. Like, we don't have to get all into that quote, Coach. I know you've heard that a million times. But tell me about your time in Boulder and tell me about what you learned while you were there. Yeah. Well, one thing I will say about that, it, people are going to go, did that make you mad and embarrass you? And it, It's kind of the, the power of media a little bit. But I was sitting around with some media guys yucking it up and I wasn't, I wasn't doing it to be, I was really kind of just hamming and egging it more than anything else. But you know, me, when I talk about, you know, it's not like nothing is really intramurals to me. And it doesn't mean you can't have fun, but like, like life, like it's, it's life. I mean, we're, we're, we're dealing with this stuff all the time. So that was really the inference of that, but it, it was funny how that kind of blew up and, you know, people are going, well, I saw it. I go, you didn't see it because there was no video. And they go, well, yeah, I did. but people believe that they saw it. And I go, there's no video of it. I mean, it's just all sound. But um, I, I, I learned, a, I did learn a lot at Colorado. I really did. Um, and it was, it was learning. It was kind of the school of hard knocks. But I think, I think I, I always call it chapter 17, but you could write a, a bunch of things. I, I really aired, this is probably my biggest air is that you, every situation is unique and it, it, it involves a certain set of skills and a certain set of strategies to affect that situation at that time in that place. I did not do a good job of adjusting and adapting and formulating that, um, and I think that's, that was probably just the, the biggest crime of where Colorado was at that time and being in the Big 12. Texas was just coming off beating USC in the Rose Bowl. I think it was the Rose Bowl where Vince Young ran in at the end. I mean, they were great. Missouri was great. Kansas was making a run at the time. I mean, it was, it, it, it was a really good conference. But I just, I just you kind of go in and go, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, gonna to do a good job and I'm a good coach and we're going to work hard. But it takes more than that. And then being strategic about your staff and your strategy and your approach of how you put all that together. Um, and we did some good things. We did. Um, and we, we beat Oklahoma and, and Nebraska in the same year, first time in, in, in quite a while that uh, that hasn't happened in a long time. Um, but, you know, we were just kind of fair to Midland in there a little bit, which wasn't, which wasn't good enough for them. And, and I get it, but I, unfortunately, you know, they, they get rid of you, but I was learning, I was learning and I was, I was taking notes and I was getting better and I was formulating some stuff. But then what happens is you kind of, you kind of lose the opportunity to capitalize on your mistakes and, and your learning. Uh, but I, I did, I learned a lot. It was a great place, great people there. 
Um, and I was sad that I wasn't able to kind of get the, the buff nation going, but, uh, that's part of the nature of life too. I mean, I, I ended up getting fired at Montreal later on for, for other reasons. Uh, but gosh, darn it. If you don't, if you don't try, you're, you're not going to fail. If you've never failed, I would venture to say you've, ne you've never grown because if you have all the answers all the time, you're not stretching very much. I a hundred percent believe that. And I, I believe that those experiences have made you into the, I mean, you, you would won awards before then too, but the award winning coach and, Big Sky Coach of the Year that uh, you are today. I, I learned that too in, in my first job at Marshall. I just volunteered and, you know, we had a great season, 7-0, and and then we lost the last three games and we all got fired. And, you know, I was kind of down. I was like, shoot, this is my one opportunity. I guess back to high school football and Coach Hankins told me, uh, hey, you know, the longer you do this, like, you're going to get fired. Like, if you, if you haven't gotten fired, you haven't coached long enough yet. And you know that firsthand. All, all great coaches get fired. I think the mistake art, art that some people make, I, there's two sides of it. I really beat myself up a lot and I shouldn't have done that. I did take a lot of notes, but I think you always have to own it. I'm into this mastery orientation and you can't just say, well, it was their fault or the AD's fault or the school's fault. In order to really take advantage of the situation, you have to own it. And you have to go say, we should have done this. We should have done that. And, and hey, in retrospect, everything's pretty clear. But only then can you grow and get better for the next place. If you're just walking away going, well, it happens. Oh, it's bad luck. Oh, you know, that guy or this guy. You lose the lesson. And that, that's the biggest crime. 100%. 100%. Learning from that experience, right? 100%. Well, that, to get on something uh, better terms, um, talking about your opening press conference at Davis and one of the things you said is my only goal is to get through this interview without crying and it didn't last long, but uh, you know, and then kind of fast forward, I got to walk through the new facility at UC Davis. You built, we built a $60 million new EFAC facility there. And uh, you know, some people said, I don't know. I don't know if Hawk uh, likes it or, you know, he looks a little disappointed or stoic to me. I thought you were just, really impressed with what you had built and what the whole program has built. Um, you know, talk to me about what it means to be the head coach at UC Davis to you. You know, it's funny. I talk about this uh, all the time with my family, Ark, and they, they get with me. I go to a restaurant and I think about how can they make this better? I mean, I, that's just how I'm wired. I, and it doesn't mean I can't appreciate a good boat or a good music or a good movie or, or, or a good restaurant, but I'm always going, man, if they did this, this would be awesome. If they did this, they could go. I'm just wired that way. And so no matter what happens, it's kind of like, what else can we do? You know, how can we get a little bit better? Cause that's just how I'm wired. So sometimes for some people, it's like, he's never happy. He's never satisfied. And to some degree they're right. Cause I'm just not the kind of guy that's going to sit on the throne and go, yeah, everything's great. Let's just like, it's, how do we get, how do I get better? How do I improve? And so, but the power of UC Davis, I mean, in three years, Kevin blue really got behind it. And then obviously Bruce Edwards, and we had several other people involved as well, but the power of UC Davis to go out and raise $60 million in three years is, I mean, this place, UC Davis is capable of being an FBS team, a very good FBS team, as you well know. I always say, we're Cal and, and, and UCLA playing football in the big sky. I mean, we're 45,000. We're a top 10 public institution. We're, we're number one in the world in several academic categories. I mean, it is a major institution. Um, I think I said a thing to you coaches this morning. I saw the kind of the average starting salary of the top 50 FBS teams and I looked up Davis's and we'd be we'd be in the top 25, oh, 25. of those schools so um but that's the firepower of UC Davis and I don't where I'm at in my career now it's not what I have built because it all is on the backs of the players and the coaches that have come before us and the feeling that all these players and coaches and alums have for Davis football and the force multiplier it was in their life and the way it was done and how it was done. 
um, that means a lot to them and it means a lot to me. And, and really what I want to do is to make sure that the legacy of Aggie football is sustained and the way in which it is done is sustained. It's not just remember all these people. That's part of it. But let's keep this thing going where you can go rafting in the middle of camp, where you can take kids to Black Wall Street before you play them, where it's okay for a guy to miss part of training camp because he's on internship in Thailand, where kids can go and travel and study abroad in the spring quarter, where we look at life from this broad spectrum, but to still win championships, go to the playoffs. You know, we've got a kid playing for the Saints. Whelan's playing for the Saints. Bryce Rogers is with the Falcons. Keelan Doss is with the, with the Giants. And Jake Mayer's with Calgary. Like, you can be an NFL player, but we also have guys going to med school. You know, we have guys at Salesforce. I mean, we have a guy at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. I mean, you can do all these other things and be great in football. And that's where I think some people miss it. It's like, well, it has to be one or the other. It doesn't. It doesn't. It can be both. 100%. That's one thing that I noticed when I came here. And those opportunities, for example, studying abroad after you go through spring ball, I mean, that's unheard of. There is no other place like that where you can do that. And, and you kind of hit off into my next question here. And it's a little bit extensive. So hang with me. We got UC Davis is a top 25 program, right? Went to the playoffs in, in what could have been two of the last three seasons, COVID and all that beat an FCS opponent. You've beaten two FCS uh, or FBS, I'm sorry, opponents since you've been here. Fan attendance levels were at a record high. Two of the most highly attended UC Davis games coming last season. We got a new $60 million EFAC building with athletic facility, coaches' offices, meeting room, weight room. That's nicer than most FBS schools and Power 5 schools that I've been at or seen. You got 46,000 kids that go here, 45 you know, a year and 250,000 alumni, you know, I, I've heard these questions too. I want to get your thoughts. When you hear about conference realignment, the common question is, is where does that leave the Aggies in the future? What's your thoughts on that? You hit on that a little bit earlier. Well, I think we're certainly capable of that, but it's got to make sense money wise and geography wise and philosophy wise as well. I think you're starting to obviously see, you saw UCLA and, and SC go to the big 10 I still think there's going to be a leveling out. You're going to have semi-pro football, and then you're going to have two groupings and FCS. And I think teams that are not able to be self-sustaining are going to struggle. What's happened is they've lived off the trickle-down effect a little bit, and that is not going to – I don't think that's going to continue to happen. So, you know, can we compete at that level in the Mountain West level? Yeah. Yeah, we could. Um but it's got to make sense. And I think you have to see what happens at some of those. Uh, number one, I think one could be said, well, you need to, you know, you need to be a dominant force in FCS before you do that. And I, and I see that. Um, but it's really just about chasing excellence. And if that means we're, I mean, I, I look at what North Dakota State is doing or has done. And, and we played them, I think, three years in a row in the playoffs. When I was here, we beat them my senior year. And I think we lost to them a couple of years uh, after that, but you look at where they've gone and what they do, and and Davis is certainly capable of being that kind of a of a sentinel in in the F FCS as well. So, you know, we'll just have to see how all that shakes out. And I don't think anybody with a crystal ball. I mean, you probably could have asked a hundred people in the country two weeks ago, is USC and UCLA going to the Big Ten, and they would have said no way. Probably a hundred of them. So who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, who knows? Absolutely. But yes, the room for growth that you even talked about the stadium too, right? There's, there's room to expand if needed. And um, I mean, just the, the support of the, the Aggies is unbelievable here. Yeah, it can be, it can be big. It can be real big. That's good. Okay. Well, we've gone through a good amount of, of questions here, but I got to throw some Hawkisms at you. All right. And you're, this is our new segment, Coach Hawk. This is our, I'm going to give you some of your phrases and you tell me a short description of what that means to you. Does that sound good? Okay. Hopefully okay. I know. Yeah, no, you'll definitely know. You say these all the time or from what I've gathered. Okay. What is work-life balance to you? It doesn't mean it's equal, but it means there has to be a sliver in there. You cannot, I mean, the best thing you can do is sleep. The best thing you can do is rest. The best thing you can do is recovery. 
So, but I think you have to be able to work through there. That's why I give you guys two off, two hours off at lunch. I know some people, we had a guy that was on our staff before that left to another school. And, you know, I give you guys three, four weeks off in the summer. He told his other coach, he goes, nobody does that. And he goes, well, I know somebody that does well, but that's also because I know I, I trust all our guys. They're going to, Hey, I have the internet up here. I'm up at, in McCall, Idaho. Hey, if I have internet, I can watch film. I don't have to be sitting in an office at UC Davis. I can, I can email, I can text, I send in Hicks documents. I mean, we, so it's being able to weave that and understand that uh, I learned this from dirt date night on Thursday nights. Got to have, got to have date light, but you have to figure out how do we weave this in there? Cause it sounds good to be on the grind. Okay. But that only lasts for a certain amount of time. And then people are burned out and I don't want to have that happen. I want people fired up to be at work coaching. I want them to have fun coaching. I want them to have fun playing. So it's understanding how to weave that. Now, do you have to work? Yeah. Yeah, you do. You have to put in time. Yeah, you do. There's no getting around that. And I'm not, I'm not getting around it, but I also know there's a point of diminishing returns. Absolutely. And guys that are well-rested, they're excited and ready to get back to work and get, get better. All right. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs or Maslow's method there. Man, I'll tell you what, I, we could spend all day on that podcast, but I encountered this when I was getting my master's degree in 1992. Um, and it's a business model, but it's, I didn't make this up, but in the short term, Maslow said all our behaviors are based off of needs. And the first need is just basic needs. That's food, water, shelter. That's what it, you got to meet that need. If you don't meet that need, nothing else happens. Then above that is physical safety and psychological safety. And there's a lot that goes into coaching that of embarrassing people or putting kids in poor positions physically. But then what I call is the big four. And the big four is everybody wants a sense of power, a sense of confidence, a sense of belonging and a sense of being needed. And I really try to, with our staff and our players, go, are we touching on these things in their lives? Like, are we asking them, what do you want to do? I mean, what play do you want to run? How do you want to practice? I mean, the whole belonging thing of whether you're texting them, they're coming over to your house for dinner, or you're taking them golfing, or you're wh whatever it is you're doing, um, the sense of being confident, like, what I hate in football is we're like, well, you're first string and I'm second string and another guy's third string. Well, how about we use everybody's strengths and we figure out what they're good at and put them in a position where they're good at that and recognize that everybody wants that. And that, that needed thing goes along with that. But everybody wants a role and there's only one football, but how can we make sure everybody's got a role? And if you do that, then there's the self-actualized person. And that's the person that flowers on the rest of life and communities and organizations. And I really, I, I tell our kids all the time, I go, hey, when I, when I pass away, you could put that on my headstone. Cause like I, and I know sometimes I talk at clinics and everybody wants X's and O's. And I tell them, hey, if you were asleep the whole time, like pay attention to this. And I didn't invent it, but I'm just telling you, if your marriage, your relationship, your staff, your team does not have a large percentage of that, you are going to be suboptimal. I 100% believe that. And guys reach their potential, right? When they feel fulfilled or they feel those needs, they're going to work that much harder. Yeah, it's that whole intangible quotient of being motivated, being inspired, and, and being all in and doing whatever you can do to help the team. And But you have to have a system that recognizes that. And I mean, you've been through it a little bit, but one of the best things we do is on our, after the game, we give out those battlefield commissions and recognize guys for, you're not player of the game, but as somebody that's injured, that came back, somebody that filled in, somebody that, you know, did something intangibly to kind of help the whole team. Maybe he had to film, maybe he was injured and had to film. Maybe he had to change positions. I mean, whatever it is, it's, it's all those things you're recognizing. Hey, it's not just throwing, catching, tackling scoring it's not just that 100 i love that 100 all right briefly talk to me about the hero's journey and is it captain oh. vlad is that captain vlad there captain vlad on the frigate standard yeah uh again this is not something i invented i'm not the smartest guy but i am a learner but the hero's journey uh is really a literary model but it really is 
life and it's all good movies. But the hero's journey starts by you've got to get out of your comfort zone. You've got to do something different. You have to, you have to leave that. You have to, you have to. And then you start encountering new situations and new learning and new mentors. And then you, you, everybody ends up in the abyss, which is the bottom. You're at the worst. You're injured. You flunked a class. You lost a game. You got fired. You broke your leg. Uh, your girlfriend left you. Whatever it is, okay. So now you're at the abyss. You're at the lowest point. But then comes the climb back where you learn that stuff. You becomes a force multiplier instead of being an anchor. It becomes a helium balloon for you, and you start becoming inspired by it, and you learn from it, and then you sort of return. You return the hero that. And you, you come back to use that energy and that information and that experience to help make your life better and other people's better. And then guess what? It starts all over again. And that's why I say, man, if, you, if you've never encountered that adversity, you've not been on the journey. You've not been on it. And, uh, you know, the Captain Vlad thing, I went on this pirate ship in, in, the, in the Baltic Sea. It's a Russian pirate ship. And, well, it's a frigate is what it is. It's just, I don't want to get into the whole difference of that, but yeah, we sailed for a week uh, on the, up, up in the Baltic Sea on this uh, on this pirate ship, and Captain Vlad was our was our guide. It was a cool it was a cool experience. That's awesome, man. Yeah, you've had a lot of great experiences just traveling and, and doing different things. I know that's something that you're really passionate about. All right, real quick, what is a Davis guy, or how do you characterize a Davis guy? I think I think again, in, in the simple terms, is I mean it's. As one of our players said a couple of years ago, it's not a song, it's a way of life. And I think it is, I think truly it's, it's a person that gets the big picture and appreciates the big picture. Um, and that really is it. I think most Davis guys can sit down and grind out a great business plan, uh, you know, a great scientific plan, a great game plan. But they also get good food, good music, good, good wine, travel. Um, they can, they just have that ingrained in them. And that's, again, that's hard because some people are YOLO. It's not all YOLO. It's that sometime you got to work. Um, but it's really, it goes back to that balance part of it. I think that's what a Davis guy, and he, he gets that. He, he understands that and, he, and his place in the world. And he's not any bigger or less than anybody else. And he understands his, and she and understands their, their impact and what they do daily. And there's a certain amount of humility there, but I mean, they can run the company, but they can also do the smallest menial tasks and take get great pride and efficacy and in, in both of those, those things. Playing their role and being humble, right? That's yeah, one thing yeah. that I've learned yeah. from that. So awesome. Well, coach, you had some fantastic questions. I'm going to wrap things up here, but I do have a great question for you. You've coached at the highest levels. I just want to know your opinion. What is the most gratifying thing at coaching at this level specifically? And what's the most frustrating part? Well, the thing I love is obviously being able to be us and being able to say it's okay to win a national championship. And yeah, you can go be a doctor, a game changer teacher. I love that. We can authentically be us in the 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 culture that we have and the product that we produce. I love that. We don't have to make excuses. We don't have to sugarcoat it. We don't have to say we are who we aren't. Um, we just are who we are. And if you're into that, get in and it's great. And if you're not, that's cool too. Uh, the frustrating part, I think a little bit um, maybe is, um, is uh, just getting, getting, everybody to understand that everyone to understand that because everybody you're associated with everybody the more people you get on board with that culture the you're better you're you're going to be so that's really it is just the far-reaching scope of your culture and your goals and your dreams your ambitions and 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 having everybody on board with that that's probably the the scope of it making sure they're on the same path is yeah. your direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, coach, it's been an honor, man. I, I, I'm very entertained. I was very looking forward to this episode. I've had a great time. You're to me, one of the most unique, um, smartest coaching minds out there. I'm freaking pumped up. I look, I get it. You know, I've been in this a little while, 
long enough to know it's not going to be all sunshine and rainbows and it's going to get tough during the season, but I'm so ready to go to battle with you and, and the rest of the coaching staff. There's some great guys on the staff. So. Well, you're, you're special. You got the divine spark. I told you that. I think it kind of started from the time you reached out on, on Twitter. Or I reached out to you. I, I don't know. I think you reached out to me, but yeah. I could tell you had a passion for special teams. That was cool. And you're a learner. You got a high degree of curiosity. All that is really awesome. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I am really fired up. I know I hate saying that because we need to have a better concept of the English language, what it is, but I'm really inspired. Right on. All right, coach. Well, anything you want to plug and get some, some Aggie uh, home season tickets there or anything else you got going on that you want to. I'm good. I'm good. We don't need to plug that. All right, coach. All right, man. Well, Hey, appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you, man. A word from our sponsors. This show is brought to you by The Kicker's Bible. The Kicker's Bible. Ever wondered about how many kicks you should do during practice after pulling your quad multiple times? Repeatedly snapping the ball over your punter's head? Keep getting dumped by all your girlfriends for missing kicks? Well, we can't help with all those things. But for some of those, there's The Kicker's Bible. Proven training methods and secrets used by NFL specialists. Written by yours truly, Brett Arkellian. With over 20 NFL specialist accounts, including personal excerpts from record-setting and Hall of Fame specialists, David Akers and Shane Graham. If you are interested in any of these fantastic tips and excerpts discussed in this episode, visit IcemanKicking.com or go to my Twitter bio, Iceman underscore kicking.